All right. Well, let's get to know Mr. Richard Steele a little bit. When were you born and raised? I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, 1944. But my family, they moved to uh, California, Los Angeles, California, uh, when I was seven years old. What was it like living in Los Angeles during that time? Well, in Los Angeles, you know, I mean, I thought I had uh, went to heaven. I mean, it was beautiful. You know, palm trees and everybody just nice to everybody. And had a great growing up in Los Angeles in the 50s and 60s. And what were you like as a kid growing up? Well, I, I was always, you know, a team player. I always wanted to play football or baseball or some type of activities outside. I was an outdoor person and, um, you know, just like to hang around with the guys and, you know, have fun and play games. Were you quiet? Were you shy? No, 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 no. No, I, I was sort of in the middle, you know. I wasn't too boisterous uh, and too loud. I mean, you knew I was there all day long. You knew I was there, but I wasn't too shy. I was always giving my opinion and always trying to be the leader. And did you have any siblings growing up there at home? Yes, I had one brother. I had one brother. He was, he's three years older than me, very studious person, nothing but studies and college and school. That's all he did all his life. When I was a little different, you know, I like to be outside. I like to play sports. And, uh, you know, I went to school, but, uh, you know, I wasn't that crazy about it like he was. What was your relationship with him and your parents growing up? Um, relationship was, uh, you know, I would say it was good. It wasn't great because I was always my own person and always, uh, you know, finding trouble, getting in trouble. He was the good kid and I was the bad kid. Let's put it like that. And what type of student were you in uh, in school during that time? C, D student. You know, I, I really didn't care about school that much. And it was a challenge to me because I didn't care. I didn't put enough time in it to study and prepare myself. So, you know, it was um, school wasn't my brighter type of my life. Uh, you know, it wasn't the thing that I really cherished. And what were your favorite pastimes or hobbies that you had during that time? Playing sports. Playing games with kids, that has always been my love. What were your favorite sports? I love baseball, football, basketball, softball, whatever. As long as me against somebody else, that's what I love. So you always love that competition? Yes. The first time I walked in a boxing gym, oh, man, I knew. <laughs> I knew that I, I was at home. And what were your first memories that you can think of about watching boxing as a kid or what you remember of it? Oh, well, when I was watching boxing, we, we wasn't watching and we were listening to it on the radio. And, uh, boy, the whole neighborhood would just be just electrified with excitement uh, listening to those guys the way they used to announce and uh, broadcast the uh, boxing matches, I mean, punch by punch. I mean, it was so exciting. I loved it. And what were some of your favorite fighters or the favorite fighters of people there in your household? Well, Joe Lewis, Sugar Ray Robinson. Sugar Ray Robinson was definitely my favorite, you know. Joe Lewis was definitely a, a favorite of mine. But, uh, you know, Robinson had more class than Joe Lewis did, and he was more flashy and, you know, and then I had a chance to see a couple, uh, both of them. As a kid, you know, if it was not at the baseball game or, you know, at different gyms when I was growing up. What was the first memory you have of going to the gym and how you got into boxing yourself? Well, I went to the gym and it seemed like a, it was the guy that used to own the gym, Jake Chiru. Jake Chiru, he said, oh, yeah, boy, you you look like you, uh, you get, you're going to really uh, hit hard and, you know, it looked very strong and, you know, you could really do something. I said, well, I'm just getting in shape for football because I love football. He said, oh, no, man, that football is nothing. He said, boxing is the one that can really give you everything you need, you know. And so I listened to him and uh, it just grew on me. I, I messed around and, and got hurt again and playing football at school. And I went back to the gym. He said, I told you, boy, you should have stuck with boxing. And because I was only like 150 pounds, 55 pounds. And, you know, those guys were too big playing football. So, you know, he explained to me this is a sport where you're going to 
compete against someone your same weight, and uh, it would be a lot better for you. So uh, I stayed in there. And then, you know, just messed around and boxed, not really in competition, but just practice. And then I went to the Marine Corps, you know. After a while, I went to the Marine Corps, and that is where I really picked it up, really said, well, this is going to be my profession. And how was it or when was it uh, when you went ahead and started your amateur career? Those days in Los Angeles, uh, I was just practicing and trying it out, learning technique. When I went in the Marine Corps, I had to try out for a team. So I tried out for the team. I made the team my first try. And uh, that's when I knew that, you know, boxing was going to be my job for the next three years in the Marine Corps. And about what year was that, more or less? 1961. So that was right after the 1960 where uh, Muhammad Ali won the gold medal, right? Right, right, right. Red Ali won the gold medal. What do you remember about your first uh, amateur fight? <laughs> it was wild. My first amateur fight, it was wild. This guy, it, it was my first fight. It was his uh, 57th fight, but I had to make the Marine Corps team. If you want to be on a team, here's the middle weight. If you can want to be on a team, you got to beat this guy. So he put me in there, and the guy made the biggest mistake of his life. He uh, stood toe to toe with me, and uh, I was so strong and you know in good shape. We fought toe to toe for three rounds, and they gave us a draw. So I I made the team. What was your amateur uh, record at the end? 16 and 4. Now, what point did you decide to go on and become a professional? Well, uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, I got a chance to represent the United States in the Olympics in 1963 for the 64 Olympics. And so, you know, in two years, I've been boxing. I won all Marine Corps championship, won in the service, and I uh, was representing the Marine Corps in the Olympic trial. So, I mean, I went all the way to the Olympic trial. And I lost to the guy that won everything. He went to the Olympics. And, uh, you know, when I got back home, I said, there's no sense in me continuing to fight amateur no more. I went as far as I could go as amateur. So I might as well try professional. So you become professional and you're about to make your pro debut. Uh, like you said, every one of your fights was in the Olympic Auditorium. What do you remember about that first day, about your first professional fight before you went on and, and went through those drapes uh, to go to the ring? What do you remember about that? Oh, man, the Olympic was a scary place. <laughs> Olympic was a very scary place. It was very cold and it was very, you know, everything was concrete. And it was a rough, tough place, you know. So, I mean, I never forget walking down the tunnel, you know, when you're coming out from the downstairs. They have all of you in the downstairs. You warm it up, and then they call your name, and, and then you have to walk up these stairs. And it seemed like the tunnel was so long, it wasn't going to never end. You walk down, and at the end of the tunnel, you get a light, and you come right into this dome, you know, the little round dome. <laughs> And everybody's hollering and, you know, just, I mean, just going berserk. You're walking out and, and they just cheering you on. And, you know, you get up there and you walk down to the ring and you get in there. And, man, and in those days it was smoky and it just looked so tough and so rough. You know, you knew that you were about to get into a fight. And not only that, of course, L.A. Olympic Auditorium and New York's Madison Square Garden were the mecca of boxing. Uh, Vegas wasn't big at that time as far as boxing. And you no, had the no. place where, uh, you know, stars were pretty much made. I mean, if you go back to the yeah. 20s and you talk about Henry Armstrong or Sugar Ray Robinson, uh, Ali, and so on and so forth, you can name everyone. All of them right. were at the Olympic Auditorium. And you were right. uh, in an arena where history was made with a lot of these guys. Yeah, and I grew up with some great fighters. I mean, my manager was Jackie McCoy. Jackie McCoy had some like 15 or 17 world champions. He, he was a great trainer. Mondo Ramos, at one time, he was the youngest uh, lightweight champion in the world. Uh, Raw Rojas, Andy Howman, all of these was real rough guys. They all worked at the, see, Jackie McCoy, were work, he was working as a lone shoreman at the waterfront. And all of these guys, they came up. All of these guys that made champions for Jackie, they worked on the waterfront, and they was tough guys. They was tough. Man, man, man. I mean, they, you know, Mondo Ramos was the youngest lightweight champion in the world at that time. And uh, 
you know, he worked on the waterfront with his dad and with his with his brothers and you know, they just rough life. They have all had rough life and uh that's why they were just rough and tough in the ring as as they was on the waterfront. And uh he had some great champions. Uh, him and Eddie Fletch was partners with a couple of uh, great fighters, you know, all the way back to Don Joy. So, you know, I came under the toolage of uh, uh, Jackie McCoy and Eddie Futch, and, uh, you know, I had a great career. I had to, I call it quits early because of, I had injuries in my rear. They broke four times, and, you know, no sense in me getting my ribs, punching my lungs. There's a chance where they could, I could have died. So, but they offered me a job. They wanted to become a referee, and that's how my referee's career began. During your time and your era, what steps do you have to take to become an official referee or a licensed or certified referee? Well, first of all, you got to get somebody that will give you a chance to prove yourself. You know, you, you got thousands of people around here, but there's only a few referee assignments, a few jobs for referees, and and they all come from the state. The state has to appoint you. Uh, famous President Ronald Reagan gave me my first uh, license to referee. So, you know, that kind of went in history books, especially for me, since he was the one that, that um, once I went back to high school and graduated in adult school, Ronald Reagan gave me my diploma. So here's the governor that became the president, you know, gave me my high school diploma and gave me my first referee license in the state of California. What do you remember about the first time you went in there to referee your first fight? Did you feel pretty comfortable because you knew the sport? <laughs> no, man, you don't feel comfortable. No, it's no way possible because, first of all, they sent me to Bakersfield, a little small town, a little small arena, you know, like 600 people in there, and they all from Bakersfield, and they smoking, and they drinking beer and everything, and they hollering, and they cheering on for the hometown boy, and you the referee from Los Angeles, you don't even live there, they don't even know you, you better give them a fair shake or call, make sure that they boy win. It was so scary. I mean, they throw things, they get mad. And you know, if you did an honest job, you're going to make a man sooner or later. So you might as well get used to it. They're going to throw beer on you. And, oh, man, it's, it was tough. It was rough. If you could referee in California, the old saying is, in the 70s and 80s, you know you can referee anywhere in the world. And I'm so happy that I came under that type of training because of the same thing uh, when I went to Caracas, Venezuela, when I went to Japan, all of those different countries, I was prepared. I knew what to expect because, I mean, I had it there at the Olympics where I worked my way into the Olympics. But as the Bakersfield era, the San Diego era, Oakland era, I went up and down the coast, all of these small venues, and uh, it really prepared me for the big fight. Is there a difference now in what uh, it takes to become a referee than it did back then when you did it? Oh, yeah, man. So much politics now. You know, it's tough for a young kid, you know. I mean, when I was coming up, you can work your way up and show them that you're good enough, you know, get your license. But now it's so much fun. When I first started, didn't nobody want to be a referee. Now, you know, everybody want to be a referee. So, so you know, I mean, you got guys in the, in, in, in the – uh, Golden Gloves, you got guys in the amateurs trying to work their way up, trying to buddy-buddy with the commissioners, trying to get in there and somebody to help them to get their professional license. There's so much politics in it now, it's a shame. Did having a boxing career or boxing background, did that help you in your referee job? Definitely, definitely. It made me uh, uh, feel more comfortable than an average guy that's never been in a fight in the ring. Definitely have more knowledge. I've been there. I've been hurt. I've been hit. I've been knocked down. You know. So when I see it in front of me, it's not a shock. So it gave me the knowledge, what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. 